they blamed high wages. With one in 10 men away fighting, able adult workers came at a premium and cut into profits. Pitt's advice was short and simple. He is supposed to have told them, yoke up the children. Luckily for Pitt and for Great Britain PLC, for the first time in its history, the country was awash with children. In the mid-1700s, the population of Britain was small and stationary around 5.7 million. But by the end of the century, it had shot up by more than 50% to 8.7 million. So, what changed? The answer's in here. This is St Michael's in Maidley, Shropshire, built by that great man of the industrial age, Thomas Telford, in 1796. There's been a church on this site since Norman times, and the marriage registers are long and very well maintained. Ah, now these are beautiful records. You can see here somebody's not been able to sign their name, so they've put their mark. And elsewhere, they've struggled to write their signatures. Now, a study of these and other records have shown that as the 18th century progressed, more people were marrying younger. Now, why was that? Previously, men and women were employed to work the land and lived in with their employer, usually a farmer or a big local landowner. These men liked to keep their young employees single because married employees had children and were more of a burden. But advances in farming practice meant less people were needed to grow food. So fewer people lived in and more were kicked out. Of course, that meant that there was no master to ask for permission to wed. These liberated workers began traveling, earning their wages in new industries. The pay wasn't great, but it wasn't based on the sliding scales of farm work. They reached their peak potential earnings at younger ages and so were tempted to marry and start families sooner. Women with jobs found their earnings could shore up new families, adding again to the temptation to marry younger. As for those women who couldn't find work, well, they were eager to marry young and gain financial protection. The result? In the early 1700s, the average age of British brides had been nearly 27. By 1800, it had fallen to 23 and a half. Those three additional years of married life were crucial. Girls were at their most fertile, and could produce two additional babies. So at the very moment that Britain was prepared to take the giant technological leap into the machine age, it had its largest, youngest population. And it was a mobile population, able to adapt to change. Everything was tailored towards delivering the industrial future. But that industrial future needed feeding, and children played a role in that too. We tend to think of children from this time as working in mines and factories, but in fact, child labor was ubiquitous. Almost every workplace would have had children in it, and the biggest employer was actually agriculture. Agriculture accounted for about a third of children's jobs, often on small setups like this one. This farm was attached to the local rectory and worked by a small team, including boys and girls. Of course, agriculture is one area where we still see children working today, ushered into the life of the farm under the watchful eye of their parents. The children of the Industrial Revolution rarely enjoyed such a gentle introduction. Unlike the factory apprentices, child farm workers were often the only children employed on an establishment. And they were also housed with their master or another adult worker. And there was no one looking over the shoulders of these men to see how they were treating their child employees. As a result, these children were often more vulnerable than the children who worked in factories.
For example, men's reminiscences tiptoe around the topic of child sexual abuse. But in the testimonies I've read, there are two cases where boys were probably molested. And both involved lonely little farm workers consigned to the care of other adults, far from the protection of friends and family. Just like the heavy industries, agriculture had a job for every age group. And the entry level into farm work began at six years old, when children could be employed as human scarecrows. When I was six and two months old, I was sent off to work. I do not think I shall ever forget those long, hungry days in the field scaring crows. You can imagine the feeling of loneliness. Hours and hours passed without a living creature coming near. I cried most of the time. And in desperation, I would shout as loud as I could, Mother! 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 But Mother could not hear. She was working in the hayfield two miles away. By my seventh birthday, I was driving a plough. Any repairs to plough or harness had to be taken to tradesmen. Once, after working all day long, I had to carry a plough horse collar that required whittling and the plough coulter that needed repairs at the blacksmith. These two heavy things made a burden far too much for me, but I had to trudge with them as best I could the mile and a half across the fields to Everdon. William Arnold was just six years old when he went to work on that farm in Northamptonshire. And this is a horse collar like the one he carried. Let me show you just how heavy this is. Oof. Oh. And now we need the coulter, because he also carried that. This is part of the plough. 40 pounds. That probably weighs more than he did. In many ways, the crow scarers and the children fetching and carrying for farm labourers were on the lowest rung of the employment ladder. But many testimonies tell us that even at that level and at a young age, the children saw these punishing labours as an opportunity. They were proper workers and they wanted to get on. In our village, there was a war for anger and justice of the peace. I began to drive a pair of horses at plough for him. And after a bit, thinking, I suppose, that I was a smart, likely lad, he made me a sort of stable boy and gave me eight shillings a week to start with. Here was a rise for a lad who was set on rising as fast and as much as he could. There were no slack half hours for me. No taking it easy with the other lads. To make more money, to do more, to know more, to be a somebody in my little world was my ambition. They might not have had much choice about their employment, but many children were determined to seize what opportunities came along with a level of determination and enthusiasm that's astonishing, if sometimes hard to imagine. For some jobs really did require huge amounts of courage. With a view of immediately testing my capabilities, my new master persuaded me to climb a chimney on my very first morning. With the feet standing up on the grate, the body would nearly fill up the width of a chimney. I climbed with my right arm lifted above the head, the left down by my side. The elbows were pressed hard against the brickwork to hold the body suspended until the knees were drawn up. Then the knees on one side and the bare heels on the other held me secure, while the right hand applied the scraper to bring down the soot. The knees and elbows through the constant pressing and the friction with the brickwork became peeled thus allowing soot to penetrate. 
It caused ugly, festering sores, which took several weeks to heal. Breathing was always more or less a difficulty. A hood, called a climbing cap, was drawn over the head and tucked in at the neck. But even with that protection, I was subject to the taste and inhalation of every kind of soot into my throat and lungs. Where fires had only just been put out, the sulfurous fumes were sufficient to stifle one. Once, the fumes were so strong that I fell from top to bottom. My insensible. Yes, they really did put kids up chimneys. And this is a kind of normal chimney that George Elson would have been dealing with. But that one's so wide that you would have had no challenge from that. He'd have been up and down there like grease lightning. What really tested boys' metals were chimneys that measured nine inches by nine inches, which is this size. And to get it to and wriggle through and clean something like this seems practically impossible. Martin Glynn is president of the National Association of British Chimney Sweeps. So, Martin, here's a very old chimney right here, and this is the kind of thing those boys would have to clean. So tell us, how did they go about doing it? Well, the little boys were known as climbing boys, apprenticed to the trade at seven years old in some cases, and they used to use their elbows and knees to scamper up inside the chimney. And um, in many cases, they, were, they stripped naked. Although they had some sort of early uniform, the soot used to fill the pockets. Uh, and because the chimney design was so small, they became wedged, so they used to strip naked so they could um, escape back down the chimney after cleaning. So what equipment did they have? The little climbing boys, and in some cases girls, they used to use a small scraper, such as this, a little small metal scraper with a wooden handle, and the traditional sweeps and brush, which would literally, they would scrape the soot away and brush with the hand brush. The exploitation of climbing boys and girls was rightly seen at the time as a national scandal. However, even when new technology was introduced in the form of jointed chimney brushes and sweeps no longer needed children, it didn't mean that boys and girls were spared. There was still a great reluctance for the master sweeps of the day to do away with boys, and it was far cheaper to purchase a small boy from a family for a guinea or two, a few shillings from the poorer families, and in some cases, little girls as well. So boys and girls were cheaper than brushes? Absolutely, at the time. In one horrible incident in Dover in Kent, where a master had sent the boy up the chimney with a wet tarpaulin to extinguish a chimney fire. And apparently he climbed into the flue uh, very reluctantly. The master threatened to beat him. He attempted to climb further into the chimney, became stuck in the chimney, wedged. Uh, and apparently they heard his screams for over two miles. <laughs> Not exactly chim chim and eatery Mary Poppins, is it now? And it shows how hard life was and how few opportunities there were that many climbing boys quit the trade and went off to serve in the armed forces. The scandal of boy soldiers is something today that we associate with the most callous regimes in the developing world. But putting boys into war zones was actually an old British tradition. For example, there were 13 of them who fought at the Battle of Trafalgar on this ship, HMS Victory. One of them was a 16-year-old midshipman, Lieutenant William Rivers. His father was also on board, and William first went to sea with him on Victory, aged six and a half. And he immediately saw action and was wounded off Toulon. I had the honour of serving in three general actions. In the first, I received two wounds on my right arm. And in the latter, whilst receiving orders from his late lordship, Admiral Nelson, I received a wound on my face, which was shortly followed by a gunshot wound, which carried away my left leg. Both William the father and William the son appeared